How are we doing? We set the recording. We have. Wonderful. All right, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth in six installments in SREB's webinar series, Bouncing Back from COVID, Using Education and Workforce Development Dollars. It's great to see a lot of folks joining us. We would love it if in the chat box, everyone with us would say hello with their name, the organization or institution they represent and the state they're joining us from. That'd be great. As well, you'll see a chat from or can access via the chat our colleague Jasmine Jones if you have any questions or problems with the Zoom. And so let's just dive right in. I'd like to hand it over to SREB's president, Dr. Stephen Pruitt, to kick us off today. Stephen. Thank you, Kim. Good morning and welcome again uh, to our uh, series around bouncing back from COVID. Again, it, this has been a fantastic series and I've been really proud of our team and, and all the incredible speakers that we've had. Uh, but you know, I'm not gonna speak very long here because I wanna really get into our, our speakers today, but I will just remind you that the whole purpose of this series is we've gotta turn our attention now to economic recovery. Uh, certainly the economy and what that occurred uh, or that has been affected by the COVID shutdowns are immense. Uh, the inequities that we had already in society uh, have been widening because of that. So this series is meant for us to really take a, a, a step forward, not just, you know, take a step back and look, but actually to start moving us forward and thinking about how we can uh, work together and states can use workforce and education dollars to really turn things around. We know that we deal with a system. We know that we have folks that are out of work. We also know that we're gonna have folks who are gonna be out of work because of automation and artificial intelligence. And whereas before we thought we had until 2030, it looks like now COVID has actually accelerated that to be 2025. So we have those folks that are in the workforce. We have kids that are coming through the system that need to be prepared and need to be ready to go into a different type of economy. So to make sure that the South has a great economy and that our, our citizens and our students can, can live the life that they should and chase their version of the American dream, we've got to start thinking about that now. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kim and excited to hear our speakers today. Great. Thanks, Stephen. So let's dive in and get going. Just a quick recap of sort of where we are in the series for folks who may not have really taken all this in. We've got six sessions. Today we're number four, the big bright green at the bottom. We've been watching the challenges that industries, educators, and people are having with this economic downturn under COVID. And so we've designed this series to, to be hopefully of as much use to you as possible as state leaders trying to chart a path for your state's economic recovery. You're able to come in and, and attend or here at this link, grab the materials, and recordings from any one or a few of the, se of the sessions that you'd like. Of course, we hope you stick with us for the whole series because we've put them together strategically to offer kind of a multi-pronged approach to recovery, some thought points that cover the gamut from starting in the first session in August, thinking about using data to gauge needs in more innovative and frequent ways. And if you missed that session, go get it. Because if you wanna learn about doing fast, rapid, weekly, in-depth state labor market information analyses. You got to go get that. It's amazing. Going to the next session, which was on helping low skilled adults get um, upskilled and ready for the jobs that are opening now to uh, last week, our session that took a student uh, approach, thinking about our upper level secondary students in the high schools and those just graduated from high school, helping them maintain their educational momentum and earn credentials for those new critical jobs. Today, we're going to take the business lens and I'll not say anything more there because we're going to do that today. Next time and on September 24th, we're going to think about education and training programs in general, in whatever setting, workforce development, high schools, colleges, whatever, programs, what ways can they be more tech savvy and flexible for pandemic quarantines as well as the changing economy overall, as Stephen mentioned. And then we round it out on October 1st. Kim, we lost a little audio there. Oh, okay, I am on, can you hear me now? 
Got me. Okay. Ah, I'm just going to keep going because you have the visual. We're going to finish on um, October thinking about merging all these emergency COVID plans and efforts into our state's long-term trajectory for growth. Let's hope the audio sticks with us. All right. Let's go. In each session, we're going to get inspired, connect, uh, share key strategies for policies, programs, and equity. We have a really nice, we hope, useful resource around um, funding sources you can bring to bear for the recommendations that we have. And we're going to hear from how leading, uh, from leading states how they're doing it. So we're going to have presentations and then get us involved in different ways. Um, preview, we're going to use Google Jamboard today, so get ready. Okay, so today's session, let's dive in. Today we're talking about helping businesses prepare new, prepare and hire new workers and upskill those incumbent workers they have for the jobs that are opening now as things are topsy-turvy and rolling and changing. So what is the context? We'll just start super fast by saying if we look nationally before we go to your own local areas. If we look nationally, I pulled this from marketplace.org's analysis of some Indeed job board postings of job openings leading up through June. And then if I, I followed the numbers through last weekend and they were continuing to tick up in this same way. So you've got some really key industries, government mostly hiring for the census, right? Retail, mostly your general merchandisers and professional and business services, your research, architecture and engineering and the like. Um, so we see them ticking up even amidst this crazy drop that you see, which is the yellow line, right, compared to the blue and the orange in previous years through these months. It's nice to see this and nice to know, but as you are leading in your states for efforts that you need to recover, you're going to have to be figuring out, well, what are the job openings and the needs my businesses have here and now where we are? And so to go to that, Let's go to Jamboard and talk together a little bit, think together a little bit about what's happening locally. So what you're going to see is a link in the chat box. Here we go. You're gonna see a link in the chat box to the Jamboard. And what you should be able to do is take that link and it should get you to what you see on my screen here, which is a Jamboard we've set up. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Jamboard, it's a place to think together online, think of a big you know, whiteboard in a room where you have an online uh, in-person meeting. And what you should be able to do is we're gonna think about this. Compared to that national look we just gave at some of the occupations that are upticking right now amidst the general downturn, let's think together now in your areas where you are working and living and leading. What are the occupations most in demand now that you know or that you intuit? Um, are most in demand in your area. You should be able to go to your left hand um, toolbar over here and either use the pen and write something. You can click on the sticky note and write something, save it and it should pop up and then you can move it around, right? Or you could use a text box and text something in there, okay? So go for it in your area. Oh, and also if this first board gets filled, we have a second one if you click on these arrows above. Let's see what y'all might wanna pop in here. And if you have trouble with the Jamboard, feel free to write some input in the chat box. What is most in demand now? Our presenters will be taking this in as they think about ways in which to link this to their presentations, as will I and all of us at SREB. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of healthcare and IT, food service. Teachers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Driving lots of IT. Yep.
This is good. Let's go a couple, one or two more minutes and see what we get. If you'd like to click over to the second landing board that is gray, it's another gray one just like this one, feel free. And we'll look at that one as well in a minute. Yep. We're definitely seeing some, some occupation groups that are kind of reflecting that national uptick of those occupation groups we looked at from the Indeed board, but we're also seeing some things that are truly different. Uh-huh, that's different. Yep. Good, last minute. Take one last minute. If you'd like to add anything else, yep, another for truck driving, another, okay. Great, terrific. Terrific. Now let's take a look at our next question. One more for us to set our context together. On this white, jam board here we're asking what in these in these industries and occupation clusters that are most in demand in your areas now for those employers trying to fill those positions what do you know or believe to be their biggest struggle in training hiring and upskilling those workers in filling those positions with qualified ready to go people what do you think is the biggest struggle they have Yeah. If the resources that has just been put there, time and resources to execute, if the resources is other than funding for the training, let us know. Otherwise, we'll assume that might go with finances. Knowledge and connect connections with systems. Good. We're going to talk about that a lot today. Time, fitting it in. Yeah. And you know, whoever is writing about time, is it time for the companies to fit it into their workload to do the training? Or is it time for the workers to get the training? You might take a moment to say just a bit more about time. Drug testing, that's gonna to connect to our support services that we'll talk about later that goes along with the whole systems piece. Time to get the training and fitting it in. Okay. Yep. Yep. Definite connection today to the systems piece, to targeting particular kinds of businesses like small businesses, to the equity strategies around drug screening, lack of knowledge. Time, I think, is everyone's enemy. <laughs> okay. Oh, and distance learning, tech. All right, we might hear some today about some more of that and time. Okay. Yep. Healthcare CNA. Nice. Any last thoughts? Nice. So this is what is on our minds here in this group as we think about where we fit in kind of our own version of that national trend and what where we've got to start targeting funds, efforts, capacity in the system. Ooh, lack of advertising awareness, we'll talk about that later too. So we're gonna have these things in mind as we move forward in our session today. Thank you guys for just taking this minute out to set the context together. That's really nice. So to pop back into the Zoom, of course, you're just gonna go down to that blue Zoom icon at the bottom of your screen. And I will put my thing, somebody let me know if you don't see, my screen, but I think you should. All right, thank you, really good stuff. Let's look now before we go to our presenters as we shared earlier, one of the elements of these series that SREB is offering is in addition to the real highlight, which is our state presenters. We have um, picked states and presenters and initiatives that really provide true inspiration for creative and innovative ways to do these things. But we do want to start out from SREB's perspective, offering just some key 
um, bricks in the wall, some key pieces that in doing the kinds of things you're going to hear about from our presenters, we at SREB really encourage you to be thinking about as state leaders and then following that up with the resources piece. So I'd like to take just a minute in doing the kinds of things you're going to hear about in Indiana, think about these three strategies. Providing supports to help companies train, hire, and upskill their workers. So that's the resources mostly, right? Think about your role in organizing and promoting effective strategies in the using of that money and your role in advancing equity. Let's just take a look. It's, it's real quick on how we suggest you think about this. This is, we're always gonna link back to that work we talked about in the first session of this series on using data to guide all of your efforts, right? And really sitting down together virtually or in person with this broad and diverse leading coalition that you have in your state or in your region to chart a path together based on data. So there's that link again to remind you, go learn some good stuff um, that we talked about in that first session. But based on that data and that path that you chart together, we wanna be thinking now as money gets tighter and tighter, not just meeting a lot of needs, but having to meet sometimes only the most critical ones, right? And really targeting. So thinking about those industries that have been the hardest hit and are starting to surge now. So where you can really get the most bang for your buck. Thinking about those employers or employer groups that need support the most. They all are going to need support. Which needs support the most? And from all of those, within those industries that already fit into your state's long-term vision for economic improvement. So really targeting the focus of your efforts. So pulling all that then into these three actions that we are gonna recommend you think about. The first one being, all right, let's provide some of those supports. So the money here on the left, these are gonna be things like grants to businesses or their partners. Perhaps there's a structure where you'll, you'll set it up as reimbursements for the training. You'll think about, again, um, giving those grants to employers or perhaps employer groups or particular training um, providers in your state or region. And there may be cases where you wanna think about requiring an employer match. There may be places where they're not able to do that. But we wanna always think about ways to get everyone to have some skin in the game. So if that's gonna work for you in certain um, places, do think about that. And then on the right, we think about the people, right? The money and the people, the system. So we wanna build systemic capacity in doing this and not have one-offs, right? So we're thinking about the training provided through the companies themselves or perhaps, perhaps linking, as we'll see today in Indiana, linking them with colleges or other kinds of training providers that can really add that capacity. And then third, connecting more broadly to um, community and labor groups and to educators all the way down from K-12 to CTE in the high schools as well as post-secondary in the colleges so that efforts, broadly speaking, can align to these points that you're gonna be placing in the sand, right? People can then align to them to address your state's workforce needs. The sec second action that we'd like us to be thinking about together in leading this work is organizing and promoting effective strategies in doing it, right? It's more than just the money. How do we use the money well? So, you know, I'll just go quickly through this, but of course you're gonna pick your agency or lead state organization or partnership of organizations to lead this so you're vetting and supporting applicants and then here really critical as we saw in the Jamboard, people really connect um, connecting with the idea that, that this is a systems effort we want to think about having those connections to the larger system in particular stackable credentials and i want to take a quick super side bar and just think about stackable credentials for a minute we're talking about, of course, this idea of making the training we're doing now that we're offering through these grants and whatever, not just be um, something they can do now and it ends up being a dead end, but rather a stepping stone, right? Up through and into the middle class. And so, you know, we can take this view from Oklahoma or, or any state where people can use the training now and then ongoing training and opportunities for growth and points into career pathways to grow in their occupation group. So what we're doing now fits into the larger system. And then we're going to think about communication, our outreach and recruiting, building those responsive practices as people administering this money with more frequent cycles, maybe annually is not enough anymore, right? Six months or short or more frequent cycles, easy application process, and using that kind of systems approach, continuous improvement approach to, to supporting everyone as they're doing this. And then our third piece, 
and this will round out SREB's recommendation, is really to be thinking about equity from the start to the finish in all points in this system. And so there's the grant portion of outreach and really ensuring that we have a broad representation of types of businesses and those owned by underrepresented groups, the training itself, thinking about ways to structure the uh, requirements of these grant programs so that they do all the obvious things, but even you know, leading back to where Stephen kicked us off, not just the kinds of training they're gonna need now for the jobs we're talking about now, but making those workers in those jobs adaptable to the changing economy over time. So those critical adaptability skills with the trainees, ensuring that we're targeting and having outreach and communication to those underrepresented groups and those with the most barriers to employment and to career advancement, seeing how to make the training paid, having good supports for them. And finally, as we think about structuring all this, coming around to the outcome side, based on data, ensuring that folks are able to have certain kinds of benefits kind of structured in for completers, being first in line for hiring, wage growth, or certain, certain wage upon completion. So just some thought points around equity. And then our last piece before we hand it over to our colleagues in Indiana is another value added, we hope, at SREB from these sessions is putting out some recommendations for folks to think about, having states share the amazing ways in which they're doing these things, and also us providing you here kind of a resource matrix, if you will, as we come together around the table with our colleagues from other areas of, of state leadership we each may come with knowledge of or expertise in only certain of the funding streams, right? So we've been thinking um, a lot about how to help all of us understand a little bit better the variety of, of resources we can bring to this work. So I wanna thank Beth here for thinking with us today about these resources. And we won't walk everyone through this whole thing. We hope that you go back to, to grab the materials from this session pull this slide, each one of these slides for each of the six sessions is tailored to the resources that are gonna support the, re the strategies in that session, right? The focus of that session. So here, Beth, would you like to kick us off with just a few highlights from this resource matrix of funding sources folks can bring to bear? Absolutely, and I think the one quick note I wanna make is how important strategic outreach with your, with your partners to employers is in a time like this because all the partners knocking on the door can overwhelm that small or large business. So we want to take a look at rapid response funds that are available through dislocated worker funding, both at the state workforce development agency, as well as local workforce boards. You want to take a look at national dislocated worker grants. Um, the rapid response funds that are associated with there are about layoff aversion. And so helping people upskill uh, so that they can keep their existing jobs. You wanna think about the states now receive direct state apprenticeship grants. And those opportunities are not only for the emerging workforce, but for upskilling the current workforce. And folks can be in, in business service teams, can help make the applications and support those things. You wanna think about the economic development uh, and community college and university incumbent worker training funds. They're named different things in different states, but those are great resources when you're wanting to support businesses and industry. And then finally, the other thing I wanted to plug is just that there are a lot of waivers, no matter whether it's a WIOA, Perkins, a, a SNAP, TANF, that are available that can create new flexible options for providing training and service um, that will assist individuals. And one that came out today was California's policy for online learning for SNAP and, and TANF recipients that could happen in the workplace. So check it out. I'll turn it back to you, Kim. Nice. Nice, thanks Beth. And even reaching back, if you will, as far as to the K-12 system, we think about those ESSA and Perkins funds in the high schools. They've got the, the facilities, the classrooms, the teachers already paid through the school system, um, the equipment for many of these CTE programs and through strategic partnerships with adult trainers, they can leverage that resource base already there and partner to have adult workforce training at night or 
online in ways that utilize those facilities, right? And there's some great work um, I've recently learned about in Texas doing that. So these funds can really be brought to bear even for our adults in our workforce training session. And then of course, we already always wanna think about based on our data, repurposing our funds, right? Nothing is sacred right now as we need to just be responsive. So terrific. Let's go ahead and I'm gonna log out of this and we're going to, ha, ah, Jasmine, if you would clear the, um, annotations I just did. And let's turn it over to our wonderful state presenters today from Indiana. There we go, thanks. Before we turn it over, I wanna preview something at the end of their presentation. We'd like to have some real time for Q&A and discussion based on you all in our audience asking them questions. So please use the chat box as they're talking to pose questions to them that we will then curate and pick from and pose in a Q&A following their presentation. So with that said, I would like to turn it over to Brian Silk, the Executive Director of Business Services from the Indiana Department of Workforce Development and his colleague, Stacey Townsley, Assistant Vice President of Operations and Implementation for Workforce Alignment at Ivy Tech Community College. Take it away. Thank you, Kim, very much. Uh, thanks everybody. I loved seeing the uh, discussion already on the Jamboard and I really wanna thank Stacy. Uh, with your collaboration and our partnership with Ivy Tech, I wouldn't be here. So uh, thank you all so much for having, having me and our state uh, present some things about next level jobs and how we engage businesses. Uh, this, I, I will go through pretty quickly, I think on the slides, because I really wanna dive into the questions. Um, but just first, uh, a little bit about um, us. So the employer engagement team, we are entirely demand driven from our Indiana employers. So the more completely we connect and engage our partners, the better our agency is in, uh, we're positioned to create, train and, and educated human capital along with other resources for our, our employers. So um, about four years ago, uh, our commission I'm really leaned into the employer engagement model uh, based on what some of our workforce boards were doing. And so we have 12 workforce regions in the state and I was once with the uh, largest workforce board in, in central Indiana. And so I was recruited by the state to grow that connection and expand our connectivity uh, at the agency level. That's a little different in some uh, states. Uh, so it was really exciting to be recruited to kind of maybe line up some things. And, and honestly, it was about unifying the regions and sharing best practices. Our state is a lot uh, made up of 92 counties, a very diverse, different uh, needs uh, for employers across the states. So um, it was exciting to see that work kind of de developed at that time. So um, for the next level jobs specifically, I, I just want to give you a little backstory and we'll, we'll kind of get caught up. So uh, Governor Holcomb really leaned into the, um, the, ho the whole idea of upskilling our, our, ci our citizens to make our community stronger, right? So for me, it's the employer, they need the human capital. So the better we understand them, the better we can articulate to our, our supply chains in the communities what that means. So um, in 2017, we did some analysis and understood that we needed to really fill millions uh, through some of the, the DOL uh, churn. So they've enhanced some of their models for, for data analytics. Um, so it started as a million and then the more analysis we did, it was millions. So roughly three, I would say. Uh, again, three, three, and a half, four, uh, three, three and a half years ago, millions of jobs needed to be filled. So the uh, workforce side of his legislative agenda included next level jobs. So that's two pieces of, of uh, legislation in that that helped create the employer training reimbursement program, which I'll talk about in detail today. And I just wanted to mention the workforce ready grant because that's where a lot of Stacy's uh, work has, has been accomplished in developing talent for employers and strengthening our, our communities. And if you'd like to know more, the website's there, thenextlevelejobs.org. So uh, what we did in 2017, uh, it was created, and, and I think it's important for this group because of some of what I saw, and I think just hearing Kim uh, present in the series. When, when the governor's team tapped us to run this, it was created for reimbursing, right? So there's been uh, historically a struggle for, for workforce to really understand the needs of employers 
and, and inform education quickly to respond to those needs. So it started as, hey, employer training reimbursement, they're training, they're meeting these uh, largely middle skills occupations. That was through our analysis, kind of a, the biggest bang for our, our buck, so to speak. And so um, when we first launched, it was employers are training, we need to, the, the data behind it. We need to understand those occupational skills, <clears throat> pardon me, the details behind what they need to inform our, our training providers that, that supply that <clears throat> much needed training. So what reimbursement uh, for the first couple of years, we had 10 and 15 million, this is $15 million set aside for this. And so this is our fourth iteration. And it was very popular and it took a lot of uh, promotion and outreach, right? So I know that through largely what I do is, is funded through WIOA, uh, but this is all state funding. Uh, so it's through, through our general fund. So it allows us some flexibility. But I just think as we talk here, and again, I want to get into questions, but I uh, really wanted to make sure that it took a lot of outreach initially. And we were met frequently with skepticism from employers that felt like this was too good to be true. I've been in, in workforce uh, over a decade. And, and it is too good to be true. We were empowered to make it extremely employer friendly and, and very easy. So that's part of why we really don't say grant a lot. It just didn't resonate with a lot of our employer partners. Oh no, back in reporting two, three years downstream, we're gonna have to, you know, audits, et cetera. And, and so really we just kind of blew the doors open on, on that whole model. And so I just think that's important to state. So when kind of, um, we, we then also, one other thing I want to note here, <clears throat> based on the occupations that I saw, we had always been very uh, open to all employer engagement. And when this happened, we thought, wow, the big employers, large employers to us is 201 and above. So large employers are going to swoop in and they're going to take the funding and we really want to get some of this delivered to you the small and medium sized employers. And there's a handout later that'll have a lot of our current data on it. So I, we can talk through that later, but um, we were pleasantly surprised that many small and medium sized employers took advantage of this immediately. And so that was, that was great. We did a whole uh, county road show, so to speak, promoting next level jobs, largely through our economic development partners and a lot of our workforce board partners. And so we would just come in uh, because again, sometimes it's too good to be true. And it's like, well, the state's here, they have the money. Again, we were met with some reluctance. So we were able to over overcome that with, um, I have a team of nine that reinforced that messaging for the first year while we were piloting this. And then as we segued into the second and third year, we brought along our workforce, uh, the business consultants, business service reps for, through the American Job Centers through the workforce board. So um, kind of flash forward to now, um, in, I would say, March, April, when, when this was happening, the uh, pandemic, we were faced with about $5 million of cuts. And so we were starting to message that to employers and many of those were furloughed. So we were doing a lot with what Beth pointed out earlier through rapid response. We were doing a lot of those things virtually. So when we were fortunate enough as a state to receive the CARES Act funding, the team, we, we branded that as a rapid recovery, put together a group, and they said, well, let's look at the, the most successful recent workforce programs, and, and they pointed that to next level jobs. So our, our governor's workforce cabinet, <coughs> pardon me, led us to accelerate that um, recovery. So they just put this into the workforce ready grant and the employer training reimbursement. And so uh, again, see on the slide here, there's the, the, our CARES Act funding, and really just uh, expanded what was already fairly easy. Um, so really job creation and rebound was the, the goal. Um, and we, due to employers, and I think again, the, the ease of the program, we already had sort of a built-in brand, so they understood what that was. And so when they saw this, we, we were, it wasn't difficult for us to get the word back out, but we were, concerned about what training even looked like and what training providers could do. And so Ivy Tech, I'm sure Stacy will talk through some of that later um, about how much they do uh, for the, the models and hybrids and virtual learning. And so we, we, we saw a lot of employers that uh, were training. This is eligible for new and current employees. So it's a mix of new employer, new employer training and then there's the incumbent piece. So their current employees are eligible. 
Um, so it, we were, again, really, really surprised. Um, Tim, if you want to forward the slide, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail there. So through that analysis of the millions of jobs that we'll need, we, we targeted our high priority, high demand jobs. And so we worked with the marketing team to put together some cool logos for us. Uh, we have um, occupational skills data open source to, to uh, the Hoosiers th through the hot jobs. So uh, advanced manufacturing is, is really our big uh, need. Healthcare is the second. And then the other supporting um, agriculture is the, the one that is far furthest behind as far as employer partnerships. Uh, and I think part of it was uh, we found out that the funding itself wasn't as meaningful, right? So I'll talk about that in a second, but um, the amount of funding that we were reimbursing some of our, our agriculture partners, they just said it's not even, you know, worth applying. And then what they thought was back in reporting. So um, IT and business services for us covers a lot of what I saw on the occupational skills kind of discussion earlier, those, those jobs. But I think it's important here to point out that we just ask an employer to identify which industry that they're in and they just cr create one application. A lot of eligible training is included in IT and business services. So you'll see leadership sales, customer service, and they may have those departments in certain, uh, uh, all of these different industries. So there's a tremendous amount of flexibility. <clears throat> so what this means uh, again for us it used to reimburse employers up to $50,000 for training and we doubled that. And so we always knew that, uh, and, and many of you all, all know this, that employers invest far more than $5,000 um, for training. It was a thank you that segued into creating training programs. Again, it wasn't the intention, but it was a really neat result. And that's where a lot of our partnership uh, with Ivy Tech is strengthened because they were talking to employers and they were thinking about things. We're like, well, hey, here's some funding to, to cover that. Obviously accelerated some of those designs. So um, one other thing that we did along the lines of our more intentional outreach for small and large companies, uh, medium size for us is probably the best fit for workforce programming in general because they have some of the infrastructure in place, they have the training, um, they, they, they know about some of the mechanics of things, but um, we've really set aside this time through CARES Act up at least $5 million specifically dedicated to minority women and veteran owned businesses. And we were very excited to do that. Uh, we reached uh, about 50 in the last grant period. So our, our, our next level jobs periods similar to workforce programs. So it's July 1st to June 30th. And so um, we were able to meet, like I said, almost 50 roughly. And we've already uh, met that this in the last two months. And it's, it's up to almost 100. And so the biggest caution, I think reluctance for employers were that in the first phases of Next Level Jobs, when they trained, hired or trained talent, there was a six month retention period. And that was always something that they were concerned about keeping that talent that long. And we asked them to provide a, a wage increase. And that allowed, opened up some doors for conversations with our team around labor market intelligence. So the idea there is, hey, um, you know, you've trained and we want you to retain. So we would like for you to keep them at least six months because it, it again strengthens, strengthens our community with better talent. Um, so through CARES Act, we doubled the funding. We set aside a, a set amount of, of uh, funding to, to reach minority women and veteran-owned businesses. And we waived the six-month retention. So we're allowing them now to invoice us, not six months after they've trained, but they wait now 40 uh, hours of training. So once they finish that, they in invoice us for the full amount. So we really are sprinting to get this funding out into the community. There are 147 specific occupations, and this slide just shows uh, the highlights of what we've seen the most in demand through this uh, work. So you can see the full list on the, on the website, um, but what we've seen again are the manufacturers, that, that's the first bullet, uh, the construction, a lot of electricians, plumbers, that's really cool, we have a lot of supervisors through that, and that means a lot for our economy as that industry rebounds. 
Um, then you'll see healthcare, and then uh, that, that second bullet from the bottom, if you go up one, that customer service reps, book, bookkeeper, those are the IT and business services sort of potpourri. So again, they can kind of move between different industries through training reimbursements. And I apologize, Kim, I, I neglected to take out the slot, the uh, transitions. So what this is just meant to show the team here today is uh, nextleveljobs.org. Uh, they click Indian employers and it's about a three to five minute application. And that's again, something that's mostly unheard of, right? And in, in kind of the, the government. <laughs> um, so it's, it's basic contact information. Uh, who are we working with? We've seen uh, noticeably a, a wide array of people that apply for this. And early on, we, un we uncovered that 60% of our, at the time, I believe it was 1,200 employers were new to our workforce development world uh, because they hadn't been engaged in our statewide job board. And we determined through our client relationship manager that a lot of them had not had interactions with our agency or our workforce boards. So we were excited to see that, hey, something's so easy to them that they get in, they do this, they get an email from, from Governor Holcomb when they've completed the application and it says that we will be in touch within two to three business days. And our volume is, is really uh, pretty high right now, so it's right at the three to four days. Um, but early on, it was same day. And we, we had a, a, a presentation, we did a lot of outreach via webinar. And during the webinar, we had someone apply because we sold to them that they, it was easy, right? Um, and then within six hours, so that entire day they applied and then we approved and they were obligated the funding. So that's kind of a remarkable story when you hear about you know, state government. Um, there's, there's actually, um, I just saw a note, there's a webinar that we were doing right now um, co coincided with this specifically for, for veteran owned businesses. And we had two applications come in during the presentation. So again, I, I'm just preaching to the choir. I know I think for uh, ease of use for employers. So, um, and then again, the next, the next slide talks about their fear about an, an audit, right? So really what we're doing is it's a self attestation, right? Through the invoice. And so we're saying that the employer, you know, attests to this, um, and it's a very easy, it's net 35 days. So what we do on the agency side is we cross check that with our unemployment insurance data. So we just run a suite and kind of match that to see. So we do a real quick um, training. So we collect some employer employee level data on the invoice that we then cross reference and then they get reimbursed within 35 days. It's a little longer now because uh, of the swell of unemployment insurance that our team are dealing with at the agency. Um, but so it's, a, it's not quite optimized right now. Um, and then we again waive that six month re requirement. Um, and so we're seeing that that was very helpful. And I think that goes back to the slide earlier, Ken, that was talking about time and, and money, right? On what employers kind of needed. So we were excited to show that, hey, you know, you complete 40 hours of training. It could be a six-week program, but after you achieve 40 hours of that training, go ahead and invoice us and we'll, we'll reimburse you. And a lot of those workers, um, that's a big one, it's easy to do, a lot of CNAs. Um, but the average wage of our training participant uh, on the program, and, it, and it's, it's on the handout, is uh, $20.35. 20, so that's uh, remarkable that we're hitting that middle skill and it's, it's not as entry level as some people feared. So, amazing. Are you ready to, to hand it over to Stacy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Hey. Amazing, Stacy, take it. Sure, sure, sure. So thanks Brian for helping to lay the groundwork there on the employer training grant. I just wanted to briefly touch on the fact that you know, Ivy Tech is a statewide community college. Uh, we are the largest singly accredited community college in the country. We have uh, over 40 locations, 18 main campuses. And so, of course, you know, we've, we've been at the table at the communities for a, a long time and been working with employers over, you know, we have thousands of, of partners. But as Brian mentioned, you know, I think this Next Level Jobs Initiative put forward by the state has really helped create some synergy 
and knit together different sourcing and, and conversations and how are we helping employers help their incumbent workers create these pathways for training and credential completion. And so um, again, you know, as obviously we're working directly with employers as a training provider with the employer training grant. Um, it's interesting, Ryan, that you mentioned that uh, of the things that you're seeing on your end with the demand, uh, we are getting a lot of requests for leadership training for the supervisors, for maybe even entry level, the frontline uh, folks as well. So, and that's across sectors. So that's been a big demand um, that we are seeing beyond um, the traditional uh, industry certification preparation work that we do. Um, and again, all of this is tied into some of these broader efforts that we're doing with the employer. Now, in addition to the employer training grant, uh, as a way to help employers with their workforce, you know, we're able to also offer pathways for the individual, uh, be they an employee or uh, just separate outside of that employer with this other piece of next level jobs. And that's the workforce ready grant. So that's the individual uh, support that's given to help someone enroll and complete in a high demand credential. And just real quickly, you know, since the start of this program almost four years ago, we've seen over 25,000 Hoosiers enroll in these eligible credentials. That doesn't mean that all of them actually received the funding because it's a last dollar program and people apply for financial aid and the, the program will cover any remaining tuition and fee costs. But it's been encouraging. Um, again, these, these credentials were identified through um, analysis in partnership with the state uh, about around demand and what is needed. And then um, I spoke briefly to the small group before, you know, we're, we're in the process of working very closely with the Department of Workforce Development in doing some more direct uh, outreach with um, unemployed Hoosiers to help take advantage uh, of this expanded Workforce Ready Grant funding opportunity under the CARES Act. And I just also going back to the employer, uh, I think one of the things that we're hearing on the ground, we have workforce consultants at each of our campuses and of course broad teams working with the community, is that yeah, it's the timing. Um, you know, employers are struggling to, 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 to meet the time requirements, right, with this expanded uh, funding window. And, uh, and they may be too, too busy truly, depending on the industry, uh, to allow their employees to take the time. Or they, they just have such urgent staffing needs that they just need to get people in on the floor and working. And so that is something that we've noted. And then also speaking to the delivery of the training. Um, I think the broad preference we're seeing from employers is that that face-to-face, -face, or even maybe perhaps a hybrid approach, you know, that hands-on training. Whereas, you know, of course, during the pandemic, and then also we're seeing student preference is more online. And we are limited in what we can do online as we think about welding and all of those other hands-on pieces, but it, it is a little bit of a different um, preference, set of preference that we're seeing from employers and the students. So again, I know we wanted to have time for questions, but uh, as, a, as a partner with this, um, it, it's been fun to, to watch it grow over the last three years, four years. Wow. Nice. It's just super inspiring, super inspiring. Thank you so much. And let's do take some time. We've got um, an okay amount of time here left in our hour to really hear from our participants in the session today and questions that they have for you as they've listened to you talk. So in a second here, I'll ask Jasmine here at SREB to kind of shout out for us some of the big questions or most interesting or most common questions that she's seeing in the chat box. As we're going though, keep in mind all of us, if you'd like to also use the chat box while you're listening to point us to efforts in your state that are related or this kind of work that you'd like us all to know about, we'll all have it there in the chat box to link to and increase our knowledge about the kinds of efforts that are going around like this. So what are we hearing, Jasmine? Let's pose some questions for Brian and Stacy. Great. Well, thank you both for sharing. As of right now, many people are quite understanding of what's happening. I don't have too many questions, but just a lot of people commenting on great feedback. Thank you for sharing. So 
Um, now is the time if you do have questions, you can put it in the chat box. Um, I can even unmute you because everyone seems to be very understanding of the information shared. So, so then I have a couple questions. <laughs> so as I was listening, I was really um, taken taken and and happily surprised with the big uptick tick, Brian that you shared in terms of the kinds of firms that you're having come into the program and the big uptick in participation by um, minority owned women owned veteran owned businesses and do you have anything that you could attribute that to as our leaders around the region here are thinking together with us about some things they could do to spur such an uptick in diversity and equity mindedness in the, in the use of funds like this yeah that's a great question kim um we we uh, roughly two years ago, put um, a, a diversity director in place that I work very closely with. And so we did some grassroots connectivity, largely in central Indiana. Um, and we looked at different commissions and we really kind of drilled down into our diversified suppliers, starting with the state level. And so then we started outreaching to different groups. So there's, there's you know, National Association of Women Business Owners did a lot for us at the beginning. Um, we, we worked with the Indianapolis Black Chamber of Commerce to help and then the State uh, Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we did a lot of that again through our Department of uh, Procurement, right? So our, our admin team had already a, a little bit of a list for us to kind of start and then we targeted that. And then um, I'll, I'll follow up with Beth at, uh, sidebar later about our layoff aversion stuff. We mentioned that earlier. I think you'd like one of the things we're tinkering with. Um, but we used um, data from <clears throat> uh, Dun & Bradstreet to target growing minority and women business owners. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, found that we had a, a several hundred new targets to reach out to that way. So a lot of it was just kind of uh, telling them why it was important to us. We actually had our Commissioner Payne uh, record a video of why it was important to him for us to reach more diversified employer partners. Um, and so it just snowballed from there. And I think perspective that I failed to really put um, during that talk was that um, in, in two months, we achieved what we did last year, the entire year. So we already, exce already exceeded our, what we accomplished last year with regards to employer partnerships and the amount of funding that we've obligated. So we're, we're, we're almost to $30 million obligated. Uh, right now. And so we had until December 30, right, with this. Uh, so we're in a really good place and that's quite interesting for us. That's amazing. So what I heard from you is data and partnerships, that diverse leadership coalition from that slide we brought up at the beginning that goes back to the very first session of using data. Yeah, and, absolutely. And just kind of being around them. <laughs> that's right. And, and Second, and then I have a question for Stacy. How did you get a three to five minute application? How did you swing that? Three to five minutes online and I'm, I've applied. Uh, yes, as long as you don't use Internet Explorer. Sometimes employers still use that. <laughs> Apparently it's still a thing, we weren't sure. Um, but yeah, that again was the, the governor's leadership and just empowering us to, and, and we were, a lot of us were reluctant and nervous and it was just something that uh, we were compelled to perform and we it was awesome and it's just basically through the website it's a few pages and then it goes into our client relationship manager and then we connect after that wow wow okay i was going to say yeah that easy button is pretty key in a lot of this yeah yeah that's right and and stacy maybe um for the last question unless other things are starting to pop up in the chat box now um think with us if you would about how how you at the college are structuring now or, or could happen in the future to where coming back to this idea of stackable credentials. So the work that you're doing now as a training provider with these grants now, and then you're connecting even to the, the um, individual side, which, is, which was our webinar two topic of upskilling adult work, low skilled adult workers. Um, how you're making sure that the training folks are getting now that you're providing to the college it is linked to and people are aware of and there's ways kind of the path spread ahead for people to stack those with additional credentials as they move up hopefully in their career. How does that look for you guys or what, what is that landscape like for you? 
That's a great question because I think it's at the core of what we and a lot of other colleges are trying to figure out, right? Because it used to be a little bit more siloed than it is now. And so I think for one, um, one intentional thing that we've done is around a lot of our work, all of our work with employers, we're not only talking about that skills training, that non-credit side, but also, you know, what can we be doing to help leverage their tuition assistance into the certificates and the technical certificates and the associate degree and beyond as we work with other partners. Um, and so we have ways to package that under our achieve your degree program. Um, again, it's just helping them if they have an existing tuition assistance policy, we help by deferring payments and, and working with their employee students directly. The other aspect of that from a structural standpoint is that we're really looking at a model right now that we're at the very, very uh, beginning stages of, of standing up and it's a skills academy model where we're, we're thinking about uh, really speaking the language of the employer, uh, using skills-based language, um, offer, offering different short-term training types of thing, uh, opportunities for the student or incumbent worker or whomever and uh, really having that career coaching embedded in it, having the employer at the table and um, saying, yes, this will match with this position. I mean, it's a, it's a true developmental pathway. Um, that is something that we have just been recently awarded some funding for um, through various different sources. It's something we're starting off with our IT, but then quickly expanding to advanced manufacturing and healthcare and uh, business and others. So those from a structural standpoint, those are two ways that we're thinking about it. Nice. Thank you. Wonderful. Jasmine, anything else coming to the chat box? Yes. Um, Brian, Byron, sorry. You mentioned that there would be a link available. Is it possible you can put that in the chat or how would we access that? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll type that in right now. And then I did supply Kim with an infographic that has current um, data it may be cool to see just this the whole um, information together like that. You guys get to look at my computer while I pull it up. But anyway, yeah. Um, while you're pulling that up, um, Kim, let me ask one more question. What efforts are being made to reach out to those with IT certificates or credentials prior to the push? Sorry, is that a question for me or Stacy? Please, both of you answer. If you okay. Could. Ladies first. <laughs> so if I understood the question, uh, some additional training for those who are already in the IT industry, is that a question? I'm sorry, Stacy. can you repeat that? I, I guess I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat? Yes, sorry. Okay. Okay, um, what efforts are being made to reach out to those with IT certificates or credentials prior to the push? And I'm gonna see if I can get unmuted. Okay, um, that's a really good question. I think uh, it's probably tied to our partner, our employer partners. And as we work with community organizations and just get the word out there in general, that there is that stackable pathway and that here are some of the jobs related to those even higher level of credentials. Um, again, it's just getting that understanding. I think the big thing for Indiana is that we're trying to reach a 60% uh, educational attainment goal, and we're not there yet. We're in the 40s. So uh, it's, it's even that first credential that I think we, the biggest focus for our state has been around, but certainly understand the value of continuing. Yeah, and we'll do some of that through the American Job Centers that we have in Indiana. And so we'll look at talent there that is, have, um, embarked in the technology world and we'll always look at kind of upskilling them but mostly from us it's the stackable like Stacy mentioned and um, we do that with our employer voice first uh, to serve them first in, in my my world um, real quickly when we started uh, we partnered with Ivy Tech at a presentation where uh, we had a, an employer in northern Indiana they brought about five of their competitors together and they promoted next level jobs for employer training reimbursement, right, to them. And they hosted, and Ivy Tech and, and, and I specifically presented together. And what was really cool is they actually brought about 20 of their underskilled employees to take advantage of the Workforce Ready Grant. 
So we had a captive audience to talk about there. And then the, the idea there that they would go through workforce ready grant and then get upskilled again after through the employer training reimbursement. So really cool example. Would love to do more of it. <laughs> That's amazing. And again, for the reaching the folks on the worker side, I just want to refer people back to our second webinar. We heard about some amazing programs um, in Florida, Delaware, and Louisiana also, in addition to this one we've just mentioned in Louisiana for that. Yep. All right, what else, Jasmine? We're looking at the top of the hour. Uh, yep, I think that was the last one. Thank you. Okay, well, good. So let's look here to finding our way around the session and home. Do join us. We're coming together again next week for the program side and then finishing up with interconnecting our short and long term plans, visions, partnerships, programs. There's the link. We stand ready to support you. Reach out if you need things, although I understand, you know, through the link we provide on the website, as well as Jasmine, do people, I think people get sent the materials as well, right, afterwards? They will receive an email with a PDF version of the, today's slides and a leak of today's right. recordings. Awesome. And then as folks are leaving, we'd love to hear whatever you'd like to share with us and everyone in the chat box, as well as if you'd be so kind, leave us one or a couple thoughts in the chat box here, either a strong element today, something we could improve would be great to know, and any support you might like SREB to think about providing or to reach out to you directly. Just let us know. I want to thank profusely our presenters, Stacy and Brian, and our um, boots on the ground help with us thinking about resources, Beth, the whole SREB team. Um, I don't know, Stephen, if you wanted to take us out. I won't add very much to that, except for again, thank you for being with us and thank you for to our, our speakers. And just you guys were fantastic. Great job. And you have added so much to this conversation. So thank you. Everybody stay well, stay healthy. All right. See you next week, everyone. All right. Bye. <laughs>